All right, we're going to start now our introduction to, to, to statistics. And this is going to be a, one video that's going to have a lot of information. So you have to be ready to write a lot. But it's going to serve as a real good foundation for really the whole unit on statistics. So basically we're talking about measures of central tendency, which you've had before. If you don't remember that, you do remember, I'm sure, mean, mode, and median. Those are the three measures of central tendency. The range, note, the range is not a measure of central tendency. It's talked about, and it's important, part of, of central tendency of, of all the mean, mode, and median, but it's not, um, it's not a measure of central tendency. If you think about it, central tendency just means it's a central tendency. It's, what, it's all about the study of what, what numbers tend to show. Um, and we'll talk more about this as we go. But the mean, as you know, is the average. You add together, and then you divide by how many you have. The mode is the most common. The median is a middle value when you arrange them in order. Okay. So, for example, you have test scores. You see all these test scores. If you get the mean of all these test scores, you get 80. Well, this number, if you notice, if you look at them closely, these are all around, you know, 80, 90, maybe 170. But then you have a 20, somebody that didn't do so well. We call that guy an outlier, that, that value, an outlier. And that's the value that is either way smaller or way larger than all the other values. He's out there. He's out lying out there, okay? That's an outlier. If you take the mean with the outlier, you get 80. If you take the mean without the outlier, you get 89. So you ask yourself, which one is the more accurate description of how that, this particular class did on the test? Well, 89 is because they all made around 89, except for this guy, okay, our girl. So when you have an outlier, the mean is not an accurate description of the data, but the median is. In this case, the median is more accurate. If you line them in order, and you get the median, if you knock it off, you know how to get the median, you go 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. The middle value is the median. 88 is close to 89. This is actually round. It's 88.5. But 88 is more close to how everybody did than, uh, than the mean with the outlier of 80. Okay, so the outlier does, does not affect the median as it does the mean. So we're going to start thinking of the mean isn't, the average isn't the one-all, be-all of what we should get for our value, for our um, description of data. Okay. So, statistics basically is a study of a collection, organization, analysis, and you can do a lot more other things of data. And data is simply the numbers of the values you collect to predict something or to, uh, to, to see what's going on. Okay, so a, a, um, a statistical question is one that anticipates variability or difference in the answers. What that all means, we're going to have a lot of big words that seem like, oh, I don't know what they mean, but if you just break it down, you can kind of tell what they mean. Variability is very. It's like a variable. It's something we don't. It could be any number. So, uh, so you want to get an. You want to ask a question that's going to have a lot of different answers. Like if I ask you how old you are, that's like one answer. That is not a statistical question. But this is how old are the students in school? Well, I'm going to get a lot of different answers, and and that because there's going to be a variability, there's going to be difference. There's going to be a lot of differences and a lot of different variability. A lot of different. Different answers. I can't say that any other way. Okay, so the pot, so another thing we need to understand, so that statistical question we need to understand, we need to know what statistics is, you need to know what data is. The population, or sometimes it's called the target group, or sometimes it's like the pop, you're going to be said, what's the population you're going to study for this particular question? Okay, it's defined by, the com by common characteristics. For example, if you want to know an opinion of seventh graders, you wouldn't go visit a senior citizen's home to find out how seventh graders what their favorite pop star is or what their favorite movie is. You wouldn't go to the local high school. You'd go to the local middle school. You'd ask your classmates. All right? That's called population or target group. A random sample is a very important concept you want to understand. It is, it's, a, it's, it's set up. A random sample is kind of um, who you're going to ask your question to. But you have to set it up so that each member of that target population has an equally likely chance of occurring, and you cannot say that that says occurring, so let me rewrite it, has an equally likely chance of occurring. I use that word occurring very, um, very generally. Um, in other words, that everybody, like if you want to interview the seventh graders, you've got to set up your sample so that everybody has an equally likely chance of getting picked to be asked that question. All right, we'll talk more about it as we go. All right, <clears throat> there are two types of data. Categorical and numerical, all right? Remember, data is what you're collecting, okay? Categorical is words. It's your favorite movie, your favorite color, your favorite book, your favorite class, okay? 
Um, numerical data is quantitative. Okay, another big word, but it just means numbers, basically. And that's when the data is numbers. For example, how many books do you read? How many hours do you do your homework for? Uh, how many, how long do, how far does it take you to get, how far are you from home, or how many miles from school to home? Things like that that answer with a number. So let's do a couple of examples here. Birth country, would that be categorical or numerical? Of course, a country is not a number, so that would be categorical. The height of third graders, that's a number. They're three feet, five feet, whatever. Hopefully not five feet. That's a, be numerical. Your favorite cereal, again, is not a number, hopefully. It's going to be categorical. Okay, so we'll do some more examples in class. Okay, another thing. Ways to organize data. There's several, many, many, many ways to organize data. We're going to go over a couple of them. And some you've already done, so it'll sound a little familiar. One is called a frequency table. Now that shows the frequency, which frequency just means how many times something shows up, how often, okay, for each category. So supposing I'm rolling a dice, and I have the only, op, the only results are going to be one through six, right? Well, if I, tap, if I do it 45 times, I tally it all up, supposing I hit, I rolled one three times, you mark three tallies, and you put a three in the frequency, and three in the cumulative frequency. All right, number two, I did it seven times, so I put seven here, but the cumulative frequency, you add up as you go. You add up as you go. That's what the frequency, the cumulative frequency is. And then a three, I did it nine times, so I add that. I keep going, keep adding, keep adding. This is just, this, this is just a translation of what the tally marks mean. But here, I have to add up as I go, and then I can see my total is 45. And this is really nice because then you can see, okay, one, when I shook a one, it was only three out of 45. Huh, it's hard to get the one or whatever. And your results may be different when you shake the dice. But that's just a kind of little example of how a frequency table, which is one way to organize data. Another way to organize data is a line graph, which you've done many times, and that shows change over time. Okay, usually it's time on the bottom and it has the change. Okay, bar graph you've done too, and that, it, that shows individual categories to compare, like how many people have their birthdays in, you know, January, and that's a bar, and how many people have it in February, and that's a bar, and then March, and you know, you kind of maybe did that in, middle, in, high, in elementary school with favorite ice cream flavors or something. Okay, histogram is like a bar graph. And it graphs numerical data in intervals, and the frequency of each interval is graphed vertically. In other words, you have something like this, and the graphs, the bars touch each other like, because it's in intervals. So from 1 to 5, and then from 6 to 10, there's like no, no, no in between, so you have to graph it right next to each other. So really a bar graph is a, I mean a histogram is a bar graph where the graphs, where the bars are intervals, and so there's no space in between. You may have a, a, an interval that doesn't have any data, like nobody whatever these numbers mean. I didn't even label these numbers. I'm just trying to show you a little example of what it looks like. That may be, but that's, understand that's not a space. That's, a, that's a, um, showing that nobody was between 11 and 15 or whatever that means. Okay, five is a dot plot or a line plot. And again, you probably have done this one. It's kind of like a bar graph, really. You just put bars here and make it a bar graph. But it shows the frequency above each category. Supposing you're rolling dice again or something. You did a one twice, a two, three times. I didn't put six, but you understand. That, that would be one example of a dot plot or line plot. And then there are others. We're going to get into box plots. We're going to, uh, you probably have done stem and leaf, or if we need to, we'll go over that. And there's other ones that we'll get into later. But these were a few I wanted to make sure you're aware of and just introduce you to. Okay, last one, believe it or not. Um, once the data is organized in all those different ways, one way or the, one of them at least, it can be described by three different ways. You can either describe it by its center, by its spread, and by its shape. And if you can describe these three things, then that really tells you a lot about the data. Okay, like if you, the center, the way to describe it by center, you'd use the mean or the median. And we've already talked about that a little bit. The mean's the average. It's accurate if the range is small. In other words, if there's no outliers, okay? It is affected by the outlier. The median is accurate when the range is large, and it's not affected by the outlier. Okay, then you can talk about the spread. For example, if we did the, the, the test scores, we would say, okay, the median of our first example would have been like 88, okay? And we could say the spread, it was spread out, um, the range would be, would be the difference between the high and low. The interquartile range, which you've probably never heard, and it is a mouthful, and we're going to talk about this a lot, so don't be discouraged if you don't know what it means. But basically, it describes the, the spread of the middle 50% of the data, okay? And the MAD is, um, we're going to talk about that a lot, it's a certain, uh, it basically describes the variability of the data from the mean. In other words, that 20, that, if the mean is 88, and that guy that made a 20, I mean the median was 88, uh, the mean, okay, the mean was, was 80. We did the mean for the first example. And that person made a 20. Well, his variability from the mean was 60. 
So that can tell you a lot. He varied a lot from the mean. Whereas the guy that maybe made an 84, he only varied by 4. So that's the kind of thing we're going to be dealing with a little bit. It's very interesting. I think you'll enjoy it when you actually use real numbers for real situations. Okay, and lastly is the shape. There's the mound shape, which is basically your bell curve, symmetrical bell curve. I tried to draw it, but not very. Anyway, it's just like a bell curve. That means this is like low to high. If you think about test scores, most people make in the middle of a test score. Very few people hopefully make low and hopefully, well, very few people make really, really high on a test score in general. Okay, sometimes though, these, it can be skewed, skewed to the left, which means they're extremely low values. Like if we took a test and nobody knew any of the information, it would probably be skewed to the left and nobody studied. We'd have a bell curve where a lot of people did not pass. And that would make it look heavy on the left-hand side. Whereas if we took a test where everybody studied and really did well, then that would be skewed to the right. That would have extremes in the high values. And we'll go over this over several days. It'll take us to go over all this stuff and do a lot of fun examples in between. That's it.